The Haunted Homes and Family Traditions of Great Britain by John Henry Ingram, Section 22, Edinburgh, Canongate. About the beginning of the 18th century stood a grand mansion near the head of the Canongate, the site of which now, however, is covered with buildings of a very different character. With this old mansion is connected a tale of terror, the circumstances of which were well known and talked about no longer ago than the beginning of the present century. A friend of Sir Walter Scott, in whose early life the story was still current, furnished him with the account from which the following version of the tradition is derived. At the period referred to, a divine of great sanctity was summoned in the middle of a certain night to come and pray with a person at the point of death. This was no unusual summons, but the consequences which followed were very terrifying. He was forced into a sedan chair, and after having been carried for a considerable distance, was set down in a remote part of the city, where, at the muzzle of a cocked pistol, he was compelled to submit to being blindfolded. In the course of the discussion which his remonstrances caused, he heard enough, and indeed saw enough, of their garb to make him conjecture that the chairman were greatly above the menial position they had assumed. After many turnings and windings, the sedan was carried upstairs into an apartment where the bandage was removed from his eyes, and whence he was conducted into a bedchamber, where he found a lady recently delivered of an infant. He was commanded by one of those who had brought him to this place to say such prayers by the lady's bedside as were suitable for a person not expected to survive a mortal disorder. The divine ventured to remonstrate, observing that the lady's appearance warranted a more hopeful condition. He was sternly commanded to obey his instructions, and so, but with much difficulty, recollected himself sufficiently to acquit himself of the duty enjoined him. As soon as his ministrations were deemed performed, the divine was again blindfolded, replaced in the chair, and hurried off, but as he was being carried downstairs, he heard the ominous report of a firearm. He was taken home safely, and a purse of gold forced upon him, but at the same time he was warned that the least allusion to the affair, which had just transpired, would cost him his life. He betook himself to his bedchamber, but was speedily aroused by his servant with the information that a most furious fire had just broken out in the house of near the head of the cannon gate, and that the proprietor's daughter, a lady eminent for her beauty and accomplishments, had perished in the flames. Our divine had his suspicions, but to have made them public would have availed nothing but to jeopardize his own safety. He was timid, and the family was one of power and distinction, so he soothed himself with the reflection that the deed was done and could not be undone. Time passed on, and with it carried away some of his fears. He became unhappy at being the sole custodian of so dark a secret and therefore gradually told it to some of his brother clergy, so that by degrees the whole story leaked out. In due course the divine died, and his terrible tale had become nearly forgotten, when it so happened that a fire broke out again on the very same site where the house of had formerly stood, but where now stood buildings of an inferior style. When the flames were at their height, the tumult which usually attends such a scene was suddenly suspended by a marvellous apparition. A beautiful female, in an extremely rich but very antique style of night-dress, appeared in the very midst of the fire, and in an awful voice uttered these terrifying words. Once burned, twice burned, the third time I will scare you all. The belief in the story, says our authority, was formerly so strong that on a fire breaking out, and seeming to approach the fatal spot, there was a good deal of anxiety testified lest the apparition should make good her denunciation. End of section 22 Section 23 Edinburgh, Gillespie Hospital On this site, where Gillespie Hospital now stands, formerly stood an ancient mansion that some years after the conclusion of the American War of Independence was used by the late Lieutenant General Robertson of Lawyers, who had served through the whole of the said war as his town residence. The General, on his return to Europe, brought with him a Negro called Black Tom, who remained in his service as a servant. 
Tom's own particular room was on the ground floor of the residence, and he was frequently heard to complain that he could not rest in it, for every night the figure of a headless woman, carrying a child in her arms, rose up from the hearth and frightened him terribly. No one paid much attention to poor Tom's trouble, although the apartment had an uncanny reputation, as it was supposed to be the result of dreams caused by intoxication, the negro's character for sobriety not being very remarkable. But a strange thing happened when the general's old residence was pulled down to make way for James Gillespie's hospital. There, under the hearthstone, which had caused Black Tom so many restless nights, was discovered a box containing the body of a woman from which the head had been severed, and beside her lay the remains of an infant wrapped in a pillowcase trimmed with lace. The unfortunate lady appeared to have been murdered without any warning. She was fully dressed, and her scissors were yet hanging by a ribbon to her side, and her thimble was also in the box, having apparently dropped from the shriveled finger of the corpse. End of section 23 Section 24 Edinburgh Trinity One of the most curious lawsuits of recent years occurred at Edinburgh in 1835 concerning the ghost disturbances in a dwelling house at Trinity, about two miles or so from Edinburgh. This lawsuit lasted for two years, and during its progress, Mr. Maurice Lothian, afterwards procurator fiscal for the county, the advocate employed by Mr. Webster, the plaintiff, spent many hours in examining the numerous witnesses, several of whom were military officers and gentlemen of good social position, but without obtaining any solution of the mysterious affair. The account furnished by Mr. Lothian himself is this. Captain Molesworth took the house of a Mr. Webster, who resided in the adjoining one, in May or June 1835, and when he had been in it about two months, he began to complain of sundry extraordinary noises, which, finding it impossible to account for, he took it into his head, strangely enough, were made by Mr. Webster. The latter naturally represented that it was not probable he should desire to damage the reputation of his own house, or drive his tenant out of it and retorted the accusation. Still, as these noises and knockings continued, Captain Molesworth not only lifted the boards in the room most infected, but actually made holes in the wall which divided his residence from Mr. Webster's for the purpose of detecting the delinquent, of course without success. Do what they would, the thing went on just the same. Footsteps of invisible feet, knockings, scratchings and rustlings, first on one side, and then on the other, were heard daily and nightly. Sometimes this unseen agent seemed to be knocking to a certain tune, and if a question were addressed to it, which could be answered numerically, as how many people are there in this room, for example, it would answer by so many knocks. The beds, too, were occasionally heaved up, as if somebody were underneath, and where the knockings were, the wall trembled visibly but search as they would, no one could be found. Captain Molesworth had had two daughters, one of whom, named Matilda, had lately died. The other, a girl between twelve and thirteen, called Jane, was sickly and generally kept her bed, and as it was observed that wherever she was these noises most frequently prevailed, Mr. Webster, who did not like the malafama that was attaching itself to his house, declared that she made them whilst the people in the neighborhood believed that it was the ghost of Matilda, warning her sister that she was soon to follow. Sheriff's officers, masons, justices of the peace, and the officers of the regiment, quartered at Leith, who were friends of Captain Molesworth, all came to his aid in hopes of detecting or frightening away his tormentor, but in vain. Sometimes it was said to be a trick of somebody outside the house, and then they formed a cordon round it, and next, as the poor sick girl was suspected, they tied her up in a bag, but it was all to no purpose. At length, ill and wearied out by the annoyances and the anxieties attending the affair, Captain Molesworth quitted the house, and Mr. Webster brought an action against him for the damages committed by lifting the boards, breaking the walls, 
and firing at the wainscot, as well as for the injury done to his house by saying it was haunted, which prevented other tenants taking it. Miss Molesworth died soon after the haunted house was quitted, hastened out of the world, so people declared, by the severe measures to which she was subjected whilst she was an object of suspicion. At any rate, the house became quiet after the captain and his family left it, and the persons who have since inhabited it, so it is said, have not experienced any repetitions of the disturbances. End of section 24 Section 25. Enfield Chase. Mr. T. Westwood, from whose most attractive communication to notes and queries on the subject of ghosts and haunted houses, an excerpt is made in another portion of this work, gives the following account of a most singular, and as far as our knowledge of such things extends, unique experience. According to Mr. Westwood's narrative, which no one has yet appeared to question, he, on one occasion, was directly and personally under ghostly influences, or what appeared to be such. His story is that in a lonely neighborhood on the verge of Enfield Chase stands an old house much beaten by wind and weather. It was inhabited when I knew it, states Mr. Westwood, by two elderly people, maiden sisters, with whom I had some acquaintance, and who once invited me to dine with them and meet a circle of local guests. I well remember my walk thither. It led me up a steep ascent of Oak Avenue, opening out at the top on what was called the Ridge Road of the Chase. It was the close of a splendid autumn afternoon. Through the mossy boles of the great oaks, I saw the golden autumn woodland reel athwart the smoke of burning flowers. On reaching my destination, the sun had already dipped below the horizon and the eastern front of the house projected a black shadow at its foot. What was there in the aspect of the pile that reminded me of the corpse described by the poet? The corpse that was calm and cold as it did hold some secret glorying? I crossed the threshold with repugnance. Having some changes to make in my attire, a servant led the way to an upper chamber and left me. No sooner was he gone than I became conscious of a peculiar sound in the room, a sort of shuddering sound in the room, as of suppressed dread. It seemed close to me. I gave little heed to it at first, setting it down for the wind in the chimney or a draught from the half-open door. But moving about the room, I perceived that the sound moved with me. Whichever way I turned, it followed me. I went to the furthest extremity of the chamber. It was there also. Beginning to feel uneasy, and being quite unable to account for the singularity, I completed my toilet in haste, and descended to the drawing-room, hoping I should thus leave the uncomfortable sound behind me. But not so. It was on the landing, on the stair. It went down with me, always the same sound of shuddering horror, faint but audible, and always close at hand. Even at the dinner-table, when the conversation flagged, I heard it unmistakably several times, and so near, that if there was an entity connected with it, we were two on one chair. It seemed to be noticed by nobody else, but it ended by harassing and distressing me, and I was relieved to think that I had not to sleep in the house that night. At an early hour, several of the guests, having far to go, the party broke up. 
and it was a satisfaction to me to breathe the fresh, wholesome air of the night and feel rid at last of my shuddering incubus. When I saw my hosts again, it was under another and unhaunted roof. On my telling them what had occurred to me, they smiled and said it was perfectly true, but added they were so used to the sound it had ceased to perturb them. Sometimes, they said, it would be quiet for weeks. At others, it followed them from room to room, from floor to floor, pertinaciously, as it had followed me. They could give me no explanation of the phenomenon. It was a sound, no more, and quite harmless. Perhaps so, but of what strange horror, demands Mr. Westwood, not ended with life, but perpetuated in the limbo of invisible things, was that sound the exponent? End of section 25 Section 26 Epsom Pit Place The story of Lord Littleton's warning, as it is termed, has been frequently told, and almost as frequently attempts have been made to explain it away. Up to the present time, however, it must be confessed that all the evidence, circumstantial though it be, is in favor of the original tellers of the tale. Well known though the story be, it must not be omitted from this collection. Thomas, the second Lord Littleton, had long led a life of dissipation. As he lay in bed one night at Pitt Place, Epsom, he was awakened out of his sleep, according to his own account, by a noise like the fluttering of a bird about the curtains. On opening his eyes, he saw the apparition of a woman who was, it is generally supposed, Mrs. Amphlett, the mother of a lady he had seduced, and who had just died of a broken heart. Dreadfully shocked, he called out, What do you want? I have come to warn you of your death, was the reply. Shall I not live two months? he asked. No, you will die within three days, was the response. The following day, Lord Littleton was observed to be much agitated in his mind, and when questioned as to the cause, informed several persons of the apparition. By the third day, which was a Saturday, he was observed to have grown very thoughtful, but he attempted to carry it off by saying to those about him, Why do you look so grave? Are you thinking about the ghost? I'm as well as ever I was in my life. He invited company to dinner, doubtless expecting, in the midst of society, to get rid of unwelcome thoughts. In the evening he said to his guests, A few hours more, and I shall jockey the ghost. At eleven o'clock he retired to his bedroom, and after a time began to undress himself. Meanwhile, his servant was preparing a rhubarb draught for him, according to custom, but having nothing to mix it with, went out of the room for a spoon. By the time he returned, Lord Littleton was getting into bed, but before the man could give him the draught, he reclined his head back on the pillow, fell into convulsions, and died. The servant's cries aroused the household, they hastened to his assistance, but it was useless, for all was over. The sequel to this story is as singular, but is less generally known, although quite as well testified to, as reference to the preface in Croker's edition of Boswell's Life of Johnson will show. Mr. Miles Peter Andrews, the intimate friend of Lord Littleton, lived at Dartford, about thirty miles off. Mr. Andrews was entertaining a large company at his place, and expected a visit from Lord Littleton, whom he had just left, apparently in good health. 
Disturbed, however, by the impressive message he had received from the apparition, the nobleman, without giving Mr. Andrews any intimation of his intention, had determined to postpone his visit. On the evening of the Saturday, Mr. Andrews, finding Lord Littleton did not arrive, and feeling somewhat indisposed, retired to bed somewhat early, leaving one of his guests to do the honors of the supper table on his behalf. He went to bed in a somewhat feverish condition, but had not been lying down long when the curtains at the foot of his bed were drawn open, and he beheld his friend standing before him in a large-figured bedgown, which was always kept in the house for Lord Littleton's exclusive use. Mr. Andrews at once imagined that his friend had arrived after he had retired to rest, as he had so positively promised to come that day, and knowing how fond the nobleman was of practical joking, cried out to him, "'You are at some of your tricks. Go to bed, or I will throw something at you.' the reply to which was, It's all over with me, Andrews. Still deeming it was Lord Littleton joking with him, Mr. Andrews stretched his arm out of the bed, and seizing one of his slippers, the nearest thing he could get hold of, he flung it at the figure, which then retreated to the dressing room, whence there was no means of egress. Upon this, Mr. Andrews jumped out of bed intending to follow and punish his friend for startling him, but could find nobody in that room, nor in his bedroom, the bolt of which was in its place. He rang his bell, and inquired of the servants where Lord Littleton was, but no one had seen him, and the nightgown, when sought for, was found in its usual place. Mr. Andrews, getting annoyed and unable to solve the mystery, ordered that no bed was to be given to the nobleman, who might find one at the inn, for serving him such a trick. The next morning, Mrs. Pigou, the guest who had headed Mr. Andrews' table when he retired, departed early for London, and on arriving there heard of Lord Littleton's death she sent an express to Dartford to inform Mr. Andrews, who, when he received the news, was so shocked that he swooned away, and to use his own words, was not his own man again for three years. End of section 26. Section 27. Epworth Parsonage. In 1716, the Reverend Samuel Wesley, father of the famous John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, was rector of Epworth in Lincolnshire. During the months of December 1716 and January 1717, the parsonage was haunted in a most unpleasant fashion. The rector kept a diary in which the disturbances were recorded, and which eventually formed the basis of the narrative afterwards compiled by his well-known son for the Arminian magazine. This account, supplemented by personal inquiries and carefully written statement of each member of the household, forms not only one of the most marvelous, but also one of the best authenticated cases of haunted houses on record the famous Dr. Priestley, and the equally well-known Dr. Adam Clark, both furnish voluminous particulars of the affair, the latter devoting 46 pages of his Memoirs of the Wesley Family to the narrative. In his Life of Wesley, Southey, in reproducing the accounts of the mysterious disturbances, remarks that an author who, in this age, relates such a story and treats it as not utterly incredible and absurd, must expect to be ridiculed, but the testimony upon which it rests is far too strong to be set aside because of the strangeness of the relation. 
It is needless to reproduce anything like a complete account of the disturbances at Epworth Parsonage, so the reader must be content to have, in a somewhat abridged form, the narrative drawn up by John Wesley, supplemented by a few additional data gathered from other equally reliable sources. On December 2nd, 1716, says John Wesley, while Robert Brown, my father's servant, was sitting with one of the maids a little before ten at night, in the dining room, which opened into the garden, they both heard someone knocking at the door. Robert rose and opened it, but could see nobody. Quickly it knocked again, and groaned. It's Mr. Turpine, said Robert. He used to groan so. He opened the door again twice or thrice, the knocking being twice or thrice repeated but still seeing nothing, and being a little startled, they rose up and went to bed. When Robert came to the top of the garret stairs, he saw a hand mill, which was at a little distance, whirled about very swiftly. When he related this, he said, Not vexed me, but that it was empty. I thought if it had been but full of malt, he might have ground his hand out for me. When he was in bed, he heard, as it were, the gobbling of a turkey cock close to the bedside, and soon after the sound of one stumbling over his shoes and boots, but there was none there. He had left them below. The next day he and the maid related these things to the other maid, who laughed heartily and said, What a couple of fools you are! I defy anything to fright me. After churning in the evening, she put the butter in the tray, and had no sooner carried it into the dairy than she heard a knocking on the shelf, where several puncheons of milk stood, first above the shelf, then below. She took the candle and searched both above and below, but being able to find nothing, threw down butter, tray and all, and ran away for life. The next evening, between five and six o'clock, my sister Molly, then about twenty years of age, sitting in the dining room reading, heard, as if it were, the door that led into the hall open, and a person walking in that seemed to have on a silk nightgown, rustling and trailing along. It seemed to walk round her, and then to the door, and then round again, but she could see nothing. She thought, it signifies nothing to run away, for whatever it is, it can run faster than me. So she rose, put her book under her arm, and walked slowly away. After supper, she was sitting with my sister Suki, about a year older than her, in one of the chambers, and telling her what had happened. She made quite light of it, telling her, I wonder you are so easily frightened. I would fain see what would frighten me. Presently a knocking began under the table. She took the candle and looked, but could find nothing. Then the iron casement began to clatter. Next the catch of the door moved up and down without ceasing. She started up, leaped into the bed without undressing, pulled the bedclothes over her head, and never ventured to look up until next morning. A night or two after, my sister Hetty, a year younger than my sister Molly, was waiting, as usual, between nine and ten to take away my father's candle, when she heard someone coming down the garret stairs, walking slowly by her, then going slowly down the best stairs, then up the back stairs, and up the garret stairs, and at every step it seemed the house shook from top to bottom. Just then my father knocked. She went in, took his candle, and got to bed as fast as possible. In the morning she told it to my eldest sister, who told her, You know, 
I believe none of these things. Pray, let me take away the candle tonight, and I will find out the trick. She accordingly took my sister Hetty's place, and had no sooner taken away the candle than she heard a noise below. She hastened downstairs to the hall where the noise was, but it was then in the kitchen. She ran into the kitchen when it was drumming on the inside of the screen. When she went round, it was drumming on the outside, and so always on the side opposite to her. Then she heard a knocking at the back kitchen door. She ran to it, unlocked it softly, and when the knocking was repeated, suddenly opened it, but nothing was to be seen. As soon as she had shut it, the knocking began again. She opened it again, but could see nothing. When she went to shut the door, it was violently knocked against her, but she set her knee and her shoulder to the door, forced it to, and turned the key. Then the knocking began again, but she let it go on and went up to bed. However, from that time, she was thoroughly convinced that there was no imposture in the affair. The next morning, my sister, telling my mother what had happened, she said, If I hear anything myself, I shall know how to judge. Soon after, she begged her mother to come into the nursery. She did, and heard in the corner of the room, as it were, the violent rocking of a cradle but no cradle had been there for some years. She was convinced it was preternatural, and earnestly prayed it might not disturb her in her own chamber at the hours of retirement, and it never did. She now thought it was proper to tell my father, but he was extremely angry and said, Suki, I am ashamed of you. These boys and girls frighten one another, but you are a woman of sense and should know better. Let me hear of it no more. At six in the evening, he had family prayers as usual. When he began the prayer for the king, a knocking began all round the room, and a thundering knock attended the amen. The same was heard from this time every morning and evening, while the prayer for the king was repeated. As both my father and mother are now at rest, and incapable of being pained thereby, I think it my duty to furnish the serious reader with a key to this circumstance. The year before King William died, my father observed my mother did not say amen to the prayer for the king. She said she would not, for she did not believe the Prince of Orange was king. He vowed he would never cohabit with her until she did. He then took his horse and rode away, nor did she hear anything of him for a twelve month. He then came back and lived with her as before. But I fear his vow was not forgotten before God. Being informed that Mr. Hoole the vicar of Haxey, resumes John Wesley, could give me some further information, I walked over to him. He said, referring to the bygone disturbances at Epworth Parsonage, Robert Brown came over to me and told me your father desired my company. When I came, he gave me an account of all that had happened particularly the knocking during family prayer. But that evening, to my great satisfaction, we heard no knocking at all. But between nine and ten, a servant came in and said, Old Geoffrey is coming. That was the name of one that had died in the house. For I hear the signal. This, they informed me, was heard every night about a quarter before ten. It was towards the top of the house, on the outside at the northeast corner, resembling the loud creaking of a saw, or rather that of a windmill, when the body of it is turned about in order to shift the sails to the wind. 
we then heard a knocking over our heads, and Mr. Wesley, catching up a candle, said, Come, sir, now you shall hear for yourself. We went upstairs, he with much hope, and I, to say the truth, with much fear. When we came into the nursery, it was knocking in the next room. When we went there, it was knocking in the nursery, and there it continued to knock, though we came in, and particularly at the head of the bed, which was of wood, in which Miss Hetty and two of her younger sisters lay. Mr. Wesley, observing that they were much affected, though asleep, sweating and trembling exceedingly, was very angry, and, pulling out a pistol, was going to fire at the place whence the sound came. But I snatched him by the arm and said, Sir, you are convinced that this is something preternatural. If so, you cannot hurt it, but you give it power to hurt you. He then went close to the place and said sternly, Thou deaf and dumb devil, why dost thou fright these children who cannot answer for themselves? Come to me in my study, that I am a man. Instantly it knocked his knock, the particular knock which he always used at the gate, as if it would shiver the board to pieces, and we heard nothing more that night. Commenting upon this portion of the narrative, as furnished by the Reverend Mr. Houle, John Wesley remarks, Till this time my father had never heard the least disturbance in his study, but the next evening, as he attempted to go into his study, of which none had the key but himself, when he opened the door, it was thrust back with such violence as had like to have thrown him down. However, he thrust the door open and went in. Presently there was a knocking, first on one side, then on the other, and after a time in the next room, wherein my sister Nancy was. He went into that room, and the noise continuing adjured it to speak, but in vain. He then said, These spirits love darkness. Put out the candle, and perhaps it will speak. She did so, and he repeated the adjuration but still there was only knocking and no articulate sound. Upon this he said, Nancy, two Christians are an overmatch for the devil. Go all of you downstairs. It may be when I am alone he will have courage to speak. When she was gone, a thought came into his head, and he said, If thou art the spirit of my son Samuel, I pray knock three knocks, and no more. Immediately all was silence, and there was no more knocking all that night. I asked my sister Nancy, then fifteen years old, whether she was not afraid when my father used that adjuration. She answered she was sadly afraid it would speak when she put out the candle but she was not at all afraid in the daytime when it walked after her, only she thought when she was about her work he might have done it for her and saved her the trouble. By this time, continues John Wesley, all my sisters were so accustomed to these noises that they gave them little disturbance. A gentle tapping at their bedhead usually began between nine and ten at night. Then they commonly said to each other, Geoffrey is coming, it is time to go to sleep. And if they heard a noise in the day, and said to my youngest sister, Hark, Kezzy, Geoffrey is knocking above, she would run upstairs and pursue it from room to room, saying she had no better diversion. My father and mother had just gone to bed, says Wesley, citing another instance of these mysterious disturbances, and the candle was not taken away when they heard three blows, and a second and a third three, as it were, with a large oaken staff, 
struck upon a chest which stood by the bedside. My father immediately arose, put on his nightgown, and hearing great noises below, took the candle and went down. My mother walked by his side. As they went down the broad stairs, they heard as if a vessel full of silver was poured upon my mother's breast and ran jingling down to her feet. Quickly after, there was a sound as if a large iron bell were thrown among many bottles under the stairs, but nothing was hurt. Soon after, our large mastiff dog came and ran to shelter himself between them. While the disturbances continued, he used to bark and leap and snap on one side and the other, and that frequently before any person in the room heard any noise at all. But after two or three days, he used to tremble and creep away before the noise began. And by this, the family knew it was at hand, nor did the observation ever fail. A little before my father and mother came into the hall, says Whistley, resuming the thread of his story, it seemed as if a very large coal was violently thrown upon the floor and dashed all in pieces, but nothing was seen. My father then cried out, Suki, do you not hear? All the pewter is thrown about the kitchen. But when they looked, all the pewter stood in its place. Then there was a loud knocking at the back door. My father opened it, but saw nothing. It was then at the front door. He opened that, but it was still lost labor. After opening first the one, then the other, several times, he turned and went up to bed. But the noises were so violent all over the house that he could not sleep till four in the morning. Several gentlemen and clergymen now earnestly advise my father, concludes Wesley, to quit the house. But he constantly answered, No, let the devil flee from me. I will never flee from the devil. But he wrote to my eldest brother at London to come down. He was preparing so to do when another letter came, informing him the disturbances were over after they had continued the latter part of the time, day and night, from the 2nd of December to the end of January. The elder Wesley's diary fully confirms all the more remarkable portions of John Wesley's narrative, and even mentions some curious incidents not given by the son. For instance, the Reverend Samuel says, I have been thrice pushed by an invisible power, once against the corner of my desk in the study, a second time against the door of the matted chamber, a third time against the right side of the frame of my study door as I was going in. On the 25th December, he records, Our mastiff came whining to us, as he did always after the first night of its coming, for then he barked violently at it, but was silent afterwards, and seemed more afraid than any of the children. John Wesley also received several lengthy letters from various members of the family, corroborating the various details already given. But these communications are too lengthy to cite, besides being frequently but repetitions of the same or similar stories. From a letter written by Emily Wesley, afterwards Mrs. Harper, some extracts, however, may be given. A whole month was sufficient to convince anybody, she writes, of the reality of the thing. I shall only tell you what I myself heard, and leave the rest to others. My sisters in the paper chamber had heard noises, and told me of them, but I did not much believe till one night, about a week after the first groans were heard, which was the beginning. Just after the clock struck ten, 
I went downstairs to lock the doors, which I always do. Scarce had I got up the west stairs when I heard a noise, like a person throwing down a vast coal in the middle of the fork kitchen. I was not much frighted, but went to my sister Suki, and we together went all over the lower rooms, but there was nothing out of order. Our dog was fast asleep, and our only cat in the other end of the house. No sooner was I got upstairs and undressing for bed, but I heard a noise. This made me hasten to bed. But my sister Hetty, who sits always to wait on my father, going to bed, was still sitting on the lowest step of the garret stairs, the door being shut at her back, when, soon after, there came down the stairs behind her something like a man in a loose nightgown trailing after him, which made her fly rather than run to me in the nursery. Emily Wesley, the writer of these words, it may be added, appeared to believe herself, followed by this manifestation through life. When writing to her brother John, thirty-four years after the Epworth disturbances had taken place, she alludes to that wonderful thing called by us Geoffrey as calling upon her before any extraordinary new affliction. In summing up the general circumstances attendant upon the disturbances in their household, John Wesley remarks, Before I came into any room, the latches were frequently lifted up, the windows clattered, and whatever iron or brass was about the chamber rung and jarred exceedingly. When it was in any room, let them make what noise they would, as they sometimes did, its dead hollow note would be clearly heard above them all. The sound very often seemed in the air in the middle of a room, nor could they ever make any such themselves by any contrivance. It never came by day, till my mother ordered the horn to be blown. After that time, scarce anyone could go from one room into another, but the latch of the room they went to was lifted up before they touched it. It never came into my father's study till he talked to it sharply, calling it a deaf and dumb devil, and bid it cease to disturb the innocent children and come to him in his study if it had anything to say to him. From the time my mother, desiring it not to disturb her from five to six, it was never heard in her chamber from five till she came downstairs, nor at any other time when she was employed in devotion. No satisfactory explanation of these remarkable circumstances has ever, so far as we can discover, been afforded. End of section 27. Section 29. Eaton. Several writers of a past generation, including Joseph Glanville, were fond of relating the story of Major Sydenham and his friend Captain William Dyke, but it appears to have escaped the researches of modern commentators on the supernatural. Shortly after the death of Major Sydenham, Dr. Thomas Dyke called on his cousin, Captain William Dyke of Skillgate, in the county of Somersetshire, and agreed to pass the night with him. At the captain's request, Dr. Dyke agreed to sleep in the same bed with his cousin, but previous to composing himself to sleep, the doctor was aroused by his companion calling up a servant and bidding the man bring him two of the largest candles he could obtain and have them lighted. The doctor naturally inquired what these were intended for, to which the captain answered, You know, cousin, what disputes the major and I have had touching the immortality of the soul, on which point we could never yet be resolved, though we so much desired it and therefore it was at length 
fully agreed between us that he who died first should, the third night after his funeral, between the hours of twelve and one, come to the little house which is here in the garden, and there give a full account touching these matters to the survivor, who should be sure to be present there at the set time, and so receive a full satisfaction. And this, says the captain, is the very night, and I am come on purpose to my present lodging to fulfill my promise. The doctor advised him not to follow strange counsels for which he could have no warrant. The captain replied that he had solemnly engaged, and that nothing should discourage him, and added that if the doctor should wake a while with him, he would shake him. If not, he might compose himself to rest, but for his own part, he was resolved to watch, that he might be sure to be present at the hour appointed. For that purpose he set his watch by him, and as soon as he perceived that it was half an hour past eleven, he arose, and taking a candle in each hand, went out by a back door of which he had before got the key, and walked into the garden house, where he continued two hours and a half. At his return, he declared he had neither seen nor heard anything more than usual. But I know, said he, that the Major would surely have come had he been able. About six weeks after, the captain rode to Eden to place his son, a scholar there, when the doctor went thither with him. They lodged at the sign of the Christopher, and tarried two or three nights not lying together now as before at Dulverton, but in two several chambers. The morning before they went away, the captain stayed in his chamber longer than usual before he called the doctor. At length he came into the chamber, but with his body shaking and trembling, whereat the doctor, wondering, presently demanded, What is the matter? The captain replied, I have seen the major. The doctor seeming to smile, the captain said, If ever I saw him in my life, I saw him but now, and then related to the doctor what had passed. This morning, after it was light, said he, one came to my bedside, and suddenly, drawing back the curtains, called, Captain, Captain, to which I replied, What major? To which he returned, I could not come at the time appointed, but I am now come to tell you that there is a God, and a very just and terrible one, and if you do not turn over a new leaf, the very expression the doctor punctually remembered, you shall find it so. The captain proceeded. On the table there lay a sword which the major had formerly given me, and after the apparition had walked a turn or two about the chamber, he took up the sword, drew it, and finding it not so bright as it ought to be, cried, Captain, Captain, this sword did not use to be kept after this manner when it was mine, after which he presently disappeared. The captain was not only thoroughly persuaded of the truth of what he had seen and heard, but was from that time observed to have become quite an altered man, and it was judged by those who were well acquainted with his conversation that the remembrance of this passage stuck close to him, and that those words of his dead friend were frequently sounding in his ears during the remainder of his life which was something more than two years. End section 29